it's good to be with y'all this morning. And I guess, do we have people online or we just... Uh, yes. Okay, good. Good to have them with us as well. And, uh, you know, as Rex was praying, I just think it's... Uh, it reminded me of this. He's talking about uh, the things that used to happen with uh, the vaccines at school and the sugar cubes. And it just reminds me there's really nothing new. Uh, you know, we always think that our generation or that this is something new or worse. And, and it just reminded me, of, and I mentioned that to kids when we start talking about polio vaccines and the things that used to happen that they, they, don't, they thought this was all brand new. This has never happened. So it's just interesting in how, uh, you know, God brought us through that and, and you know, prayerfully to bring us through this with, uh, in the same way. And it's just uh, always good to remember that we can look back and see how God has taken care of us in the past. And I appreciate your prayer. I think so. it's a very heartfelt prayer. And, uh, just appreciate that. <coughs> um, all right. So today, our lesson, Dewey, um, when he put this set of lessons together, he, he had us in the book. Uh, good lessons from bad people, and we finished that book last week. So he has gone out and, and created four more lessons for us. I think maybe three now since we had the one week off. Um, so we start those lessons today, and uh, it's, I thought it was interesting. The first person that he chose, or and I'm not sure where he, you know, went and got his people, but is the character Michael. And when we say Michael, who knows who Michael is when we talk about Michael in the Bible? Archangel. David's wife. King Saul's daughter. King Saul's daughter. Okay. His first daughter. So there's many, you know, there's when we say the name, I think we all pretty much at least get a, a sense of who we're going to talk about. And uh, he took that, I believe, I, I was reading his, uh, at the bottom of his notes, it's, it's actually a, a book called The Bad Girls of the Bible. And so mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting title. We've gotten from good lessons from bad guys to bad girl of the Bible. So... Before we actually get into the story of uh, Michael today, though, we're going to talk kind of about what the concept is that we're going to touch on today. So if you'll open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, and uh, we will read verse 1 is our starting point for the conversation today. And this is a, a verse that I think everybody in here is familiar with. This is a verse that when you read, even people outside of the church, people outside of Christianity, people in other religions, people in the world, I think everybody knows this verse because it gets thrown around in so many ways. So let's, real quick, let me read that out. Of, I'm out of the, I always forget what mine is. It's the New King James Version. So it says, judge not that you be not judged. So how many of you could have quoted that without me? You might not have known that, but once I started, if I'd have said, judge not, you could have finished that verse for me, right? So when, we, when you hear that verse, I guess the question I want to know is, what feelings, what emotions does that cause in you? What does that cause you to think when you hear the verse, judge not, lest you be judged? What does that make you think? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. We're none of us are perfect, and we always need to remind ourselves which these are not. We're bad, too. <laughs> Absolutely. None of us are perfect. What else does it bring to mind? We don't really know someone else's heart. So often when we get into a judgmental state, we have to remind ourselves we don't really know their heart, do we? Jesus is a whole different subject. He knew their heart. He could. He knew how to speak to their heart, but we don't, do we? And I think a lot of times we get into situations where we start kind of looking at people in a certain way, we just don't know the background. Um, I know as a, as a teacher, as an educator, there have been so many times in my life, and I'm sure there's several educators in this room, you get into the classroom and you've got this one kid or two kids that are just really a pain. And you wonder what makes a kid like, but when you start finding out their background and where they come from and what's going on at home and what they have to deal with and, and the fact that the only meals they eat are breakfast and lunch at school and, and you start learning about a person and you realize, ooh, I was, you know, I kind of misjudged that kid. And so that happens a lot. And, and so I think that's a good point. Anything else? What else do y'all think about? I didn't, I don't know. 
always think it is it's one of the most misused uh, verses mm -hmm. in the Bible as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we, we talk enough about what that judgment is. It doesn't talk, mean that you can't call someone to repent, you know, and uh, it's used so many places, especially in the world, to allow someone to live the way they want to live rather than calling them to, to, to follow uh, you know, Christ. Yeah. I think that's a great point. As a matter of fact, the next question that I have written down, and and, and just <laughs> so y'all know, my, le my my notes always look like this, and everything that's got a yellow is a question. I mean, I just go down and ask questions and let y'all do all the answering. So that's why I like, you know, I like the, the fact that this is a great class. Y'all do a great job of conversing. But Bryce, what you said is my next question is how does the world use this verse? Because we talked about the fact that we're not the only ones that know this verse. Because if you get into somebody that's not a Christian and you make them upset or you try to help them see the light or you try to help guide them, what's one of the first things they throw at you? Don't, don't, judge, me. Me. don't judge me. The Bible tells you, don't judge me. They can, a lot of them can even quote, don't judge not lest you be judged because they've heard it. They've seen it on bumper stickers. They, I mean, it's, it's out there. And they use it that way. And, and you also hit on it. On how they use it, what do they want? How how does the world want to use that verse? And well, how does the world want to use that verse? So they can keep doing what they're doing. Right. What's the big word? Starts with a T. We all have to have it. Tolerance. tolerance. We have to have tolerance, correct? But that, to me, that that's less of a concern than than people in, within the body that you say the same thing. Yeah. Because you know we're not called to. Do anything with people of the world who are not Christians other than call them to 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 come and to know God and, and to know Christ and the, the, the sacrifice that he made. Where they're not it's different with a Christian, you know, and we are called to to help our brother and to 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 pull our brother up out of the out of the ditch. And uh, so to me that's far worse. And so Bryce is going to basically lead us through our lesson today. <laughs> because you're exactly right. No, I, I appreciate that. I think that's all because you were, you were right on track with what we want. Because the next question that I had was, so what is dangerous about this line of thinking within the church? And Bryce started that conversation perfectly. What is dangerous about it? What does it make us afraid to do? To confront our brothers and sisters. When we see, when we believe or think or or suspect it, it makes us afraid to go and, and uh call sin sin sometimes doesn't it? i mean if you look at and, and part of that is and i think it's kind of what bryce has been talking about it's the world this verse has seeped in the world but this, the world has seeped into this verse <laughs> we we have had the world seep into our churches with this verse as well haven't we so that now we're afraid to call sin. And you look around the world right now and, man, I mean, I'm not as old as my mom, but I've gotten older. And my mom is always talking about how she can't believe the changes that happened in the 90s. She talks about the 90s when she talks about it. Because that seems to be when I graduated in 87. And so I was a, an 80s kid. But that decade of the 90s, a lot of things started changing. Um, you know, y'all could probably stop and think back about some of the things. I know that, you know, you had the AIDS epidemic that hit us in the 80s. And then in the 90s, all of a sudden, this tolerance for homosexuality began. began, And then it, it has now changed to where not only is it tolerated, but it's flipped. Now that if you are, it's celebrated. And... <clears throat> And, and the truth, if you, you know, if you will, has been uh, made wrong. So right has become wrong, wrong has become right. It, it, that's one of the things that my student said to me this week from Revelation, that people, what people will call good, evil, and evil, good. And you see that verse with Christians a lot when they, you know, and again, I'm not saying that we're not to be loving, we're not to be caring, we're not to be Jesus to the world, because we are. But part of that is to, to tell, you know, what did Jesus tell? You know, I always, sorry, I'm about to fall down. What did Jesus always tell people when he 
when he interacted with them, for instance, the woman at the well, uh, what do, what's one of the last things he tells them? Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. So he does realize, he does recognize the sin. He talks to them about the sin in their lives. And then he gently urges them to go and sin no more. He, you know, it's, and we're not supposed to go out and necessarily pound people over the head, but we still have to make judgments, right? And so as you need to speak the truth, speak the truth. And, and you hear this term all the time, speak the truth in love. Yes, ma'am. I think God, uh, Jesus took care of this and that God talks about um, when you confront your brother, to always do it with a loving heart. And also he talks about, um, you know, to confront them. I, I don't know where the scripture is, but, you know, to confront them. And then if that doesn't work, to take a witness. And so, you know, instead of just doing it by yourself, you know, to take someone else. <clears throat> well, let's look on. Let's continue on as, as we're in the same verse here. Let's move down. And the interesting thing is that, and it's kind of what we've been talking about, is this is uh, and what Bryce said. This has been taken out of context a lot. If you keep it in context and you look at verses 3 through 5, it says, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So what do those three verses tell us about judging? We need to judge ourselves first. Okay, so it doesn't say right there, don't judge. But it says that before you start judging others, you have to do what? Clean up your act. You have to look at yourself and clean up your act. That is correct. We have to take an introspection and see, is my house in order before I try to put somebody else's house in order or to help someone else put their house in order? And there's a lot of reasons for that. What happens if, if I go to a brother and I try to gently correct them and yet the sin in my life is so obvious to them? What does that do to my, um, I don't know if you want to call it, witness, testimony? No credibility. It, it takes your credibility away, doesn't it? And the problem is not that necessarily you're wrong when you go to that person and say, hey, you know what, I, I see that this is happening. Is there anything I can do to help you correct this? Let's talk about it. The problem is that as humans, and, th and this is it. It's as humans, what do we do if somebody approaches us? How do we respond to that nine, 99 times out of 100? We get pretty defensive. We get defensive. And when we get defensive, what do we do to those people? We attack. We lash out. We turn. We, we are notorious. All of us are notorious. I mean, that's what we do. It's human nature. We turn it back on the person that's coming to us. I mean, we even do that to family members, don't we? Because every once in a while, I, I know nobody could imagine that, but when I step out of line, my wife has to help correct me. And I don't know if this happens to you in your relationship, but I have a tendency to bark <laughs> when she does correct me. And then I have to come back later and like a dog with my tail between my legs say, I'm sorry, honey, I, you were right. Does that ever happen to anybody else? I, I, just, just me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> i got to figure this marriage thing out. Y'all probably have all got to figure that out. So... But the point is, we have a tendency to attack when we're corrected. And if we have something in our lives that they can come back on, it does have a tendency to take our, uh, I, I, don't, I hate to use the term moral authority, because it's not our moral authority, it's coming from Scripture, if we're doing this correctly. But it takes our authority to say, hey, you know, I see this here because we have this big plank in our own eye. So it doesn't say don't judge at all, but it tells you where you have to start. And that is, you have to start with yourself. You had your hand up, I'm sorry. Yeah, I believe the key is back in verse 2. Verse says, For with the judge, judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, will be measured to you. That's right. And we're going to look at a couple of more of these, these examples. But it comes back to verse 2. And that's uh, we skipped it so that we could come back to it. And you're, No, you're exactly right. I, you know, this, I'm just telling y'all, teaching is not a, a science. It can be done by anybody if you just sit down and think about it, because it takes a natural order of things here. And you're exactly right. 
when we talk about whatever judgment, whatever uh, discernment that you have, you've got it. I mean, verse two puts us in a in a a pretty uh, serious place, doesn't it? Because if you're going to use that, if you're going to take this stance and you're going to use that to make a discernment or a judgment about a brother or sister, then you better understand that why are we judged by the same thing that we judge others? Well, let me ask that. That's probably the basis of the question. Why are we judged by the same thing we judge others? And, and how is, I mean, what does that even mean? It's just... Well, if you don't, if you judge others that you're not willing to be judged by, <laughs> it's on the tip of my tongue. Hang on, man. <laughs> well, how can you judge someone if you're doing the same thing? You may not be doing the exact same act, but if you're guilty of sin, how can you judge someone else? So I'm going to use. Uh, always personal examples. My very best friend um, is an elder at the church that we love. We were elders together in, in Canada. And he and I are like the term brother from another mother kind of thing. I mean, we have so much in common. We're, we just, we, and, and when you talk about David and Jonathan in the Bible, that's how I feel about him. I mean, he's, you know, he's just that kind of guy. We have a really, really tight relationship. And one of the things that I love about him is he is not afraid to call me out. But he is maybe the gentlest person, gent most gentle, most gentle person I know in his corrections. He is a, a very soft-spoken, uh, very kind-hearted individual. And he has this way of calling me out when I'm wrong. Because I'm a I'm still a coach at heart. I'm still a, an, I go on the offense. I still, you know, I get in the coach voice and I well, I'm like, I'm looking for confrontation right now. I've got some of that in me, and he has helped me to, to tone some of that down. And there have been times when he's called me out and said, hey, you can't do that. If, if, especially when we were elders. If you're going to go and you're going to talk to that person, you better have love in your heart. You better not be going over there to condemn that person. And he's had to call, you know, he's had to help keep me straight. And every once in a while, I do the same for him. I know his faults. I know his weaknesses. And it's kind of what you're talking about. If, if uh, we're going to accuse or discern or judge somebody else, I think the reason that it says that we'll be judged by the same measure is that you understand that that is wrong if you're judging someone. Does that make sense? There, you know, if I am, if I have it in my heart that I know that this is wrong, then if I'm doing it, I'm also going to be held to that same measure because I know that it's wrong. I'm not, you know, I. I want to be careful in saying that it's not wrong if you don't know it's wrong, but you know, that's a whole other conversation that's going to take us away from my point we get there. But I just want you to understand that when we do judge somebody and we understand that what they're doing is wrong, if we're doing the same thing, we're going to be judged by that same thing. You had your hand up, Melanie? No, but doesn't it, you know, when Jesus confronted people, he knew all. And he was merciful, and we have grace. We still have to be obedient. But I think it's tied, I think it's tied to the way Jesus dealt with people and the way humanity wants to check things off. You know, and the Jews made up 619 more rules to check things off. And and you keep no, nobody could succeed living under the law. I, I think it's tied back to to the grace and and mercy that we're supposed to show the way Jesus did. Well, and I think part of the where you're headed there is the fact that you're right. As humans, we like to check boxes. We like to say okay, and and we even have a tendency to say. Okay, I've gotten that out of my life. It's never going to happen again. I mean, we, we have this finality to it. And I know Jesus understood that this is a, it's an ongoing thing. It's a, it is, it's life. And how many of you have ever kind of felt that way? Like, oh, I really had this problem. And I, I 
this again is from my own experience. There were things when I was young that I really struggled with that I don't struggle with anymore. I've, I've kind of matured through that. And yet, every once in a while, the things I struggled with when I was young, I get into a situation and there it is again. And, I'm, and it, does, it, does it do that? Does it catch you by surprise? Because I thought, I thought I had that out of my life. I thought I had gotten past that. And yet, somehow Satan digs that up and there it is again. And I have to confront it. And so it's an ongoing thing. I can't just check that box and it's gone. Because, like you said, that, I mean, it's, it's about grace and it's about mercy. And it's a continuing thing. It's not just a one-time thing. As you finish reading through this chapter of Matthew, verse 6 talks about tossing, don't toss it to the dogs, don't, don't toss what is valuable to the dogs and the swine. And then it goes into, uh, you get down into verses 15 and, and t- through 20, and it talks about false prophets. And again, that's in the lesson because it talks about things that you have to make discernment of. It's okay to make discernment. We're expected to be able to use scriptures to use God's word to make discernments about what is good and bad. So when people say judge not lest you be judged, it doesn't mean we don't make some decisions. We have to make some discernment, some judgments on what is right and wrong. But as we as we keep going, the question becomes how do we make these judgments correctly? And so if you'll turn to John chapter 7 Real quick, but we're going to plant this seed and then we're going to get to Michael. Because if we don't, we won't get to Michael. John chapter 7, verses 21 through 24. If you're there, would somebody mind reading that? John 7, 21 through 24. Jesus answered them, I did one deed and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcised a man on the Sabbath. Upon the Sabbath, a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken. Are you angry with me because of the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Okay. So in these verses right here, we get another example from Jesus. He's talking about what you were talking about. They created these traditions. They created these rules. You can't do this on the Sabbath. You can't do that on the Sabbath. Well, Jesus broke their rule. And he says, okay, so what are you doing? Why are you looking at me like that? He says, don't judge based on what? Say again. Appearances. Appearances. Don't judge on on what traditions you've created. Judge based on, what did he say? My Bible says righteous judgment. I think you said rightful thinking. No, with right judgment. With right judgment. What other words do your verse do your version say right there righteous, at the end? Righteous judgment. righteous judgment. Judge correctly. Judge correctly. I know there's a lot of versions, that, but it all is it's the same thing. If you're going to make judgments, don't do it based on things of man. Do it based on righteousness. <coughs> and the only thing that we know is truly righteous is the Word of God. Right? It's it, we know if it's in here. It's trustworthy and it's righteous. And when we make our discernments and our decisions based on this, then we're we're on solid footing. Okay? And so let's get into the story of Michael. Let's turn to um, 2 Samuel. And it is chapter 6. And just a little quick background. Um, the, The story that we're about to read begins with David wanting to bring the ark back to, or wanting to bring the ark to Jerusalem. And if you remember in the first few verses of chapter 6, he does that. He, he loads up the, the ark on a cart, and he begins this process of they're playing horns, and they're bringing the, car, the ark on this cart. Excuse me. <clears throat> and the ark begins to tip, begins to, uh, t- to become unbalanced. And what happens? Uzzah reached out and grabbed it and paid for it with his life. But the basis of that is the fact that David had chosen to do this in his own way. 
if you remember, there are rules, and they talk about it in Exodus and Numbers, there are rules about how you transport the ark. And he was doing it on a cart, just like the Philistines did. He wasn't treating it with the respect and, and with the reverence that God had designed for that ark. It was to be carried by men with poles, and it was very specific about how they were supposed to be doing it. He wasn't doing that. And so he ends up not bringing the ark into Jerusalem at that time. But very quickly then, David basically repents of what he had done. And then he goes and he brings the ark in and he does it correctly. He has it carried on the poles. He's, he's, uh, they stop after six paces and give a sacrifice. And, 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 and so he's trying to do this right. And as he's doing that, if you remember the story, what does David do? Okay, he starts to dance. So let's read about this. Chapter 6, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 13 through 15. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpets. And so there's two probably big things you notice here. Number one, he's actually... He's having it done correctly. It says um, in verse 13 that those bearing the ark. So it's no longer on a cart, is it? It's being carried correctly. And then he stops and offers sacrifices. But what? there's two things that David does here. What are the two things that David does that show his, uh, oh, what, what two actions does he take, I guess, and what do those two actions show about him and what he has changed between the first time he brought the ark and this time he tried? What's, what two actions? I think one of them is in, well, they're both in verse 14. He was dancing before the Lord with all. He's wearing the linen ephod. Okay, so number one, and we're going, actually, I guess it's number two because it's the same one's mentioned, but he's wearing a linen ephod. What does that mean? What is David? King. He's king. What do kings wear? Crown. Crowns, robes, the royal robes, the, the, the royal colors, the fancy dress, the gold rings, the, you know, just the adornment of a king to show what? How, how much authority they have, how great they are. It, it lifts them above everyone else. That's not what David's wearing. What's David wearing? What the priest wore. What the priest wore. And, and there's some discussion in, in the... Uh, the books that I was looking at about what a linen ephod is, there's, there seem to be two common things. One is either it was a very thin material that was kind of like a drape, or I think as the, the scripture kind of backs it up when you hear what Michael actually accuses him of, a lot of them say it's just like a waist cloth that just barely covered very much. And so anyway, he's, he's dressed not like a king. Why would he do that? What, what does that show? Okay, it's humility. He's humbling himself before God. And so he is he is putting himself in this place of humility. He's as a king, he is doing that where who sees him? Everybody. Everybody. His whole kingdom sees him do this. And by doing that, what does he exalt? Or who does he exalt? God. God. Correct. So by by doing this, even just by the way he dressed. It showed a certain amount of, of uh, humility and reverence to God. We go back, and as he's dancing, it says he dances how? He, his mind. he dances with all of his mind. What does that kind of, uh, so what does that throw us to? What does that help us to? That's the other thing. I mean, if he had all these robes on, he couldn't have danced with all his mind, or he would have tripped and fallen down. <laughs> okay. I hadn't even thought of that, but yes, that's quite likely. I don't know if that went to his mind or not. <laughs> so he dances with all of his might. And, and basically, when you hear Dave, uh, when you hear Michael describe it later on, you get the idea that what did he, well, I mean, did he care what anybody thought? Apparently not. Apparently, he was worshiping God, and he just didn't care. He was dancing and, and twirling and kicking and whatever else he was doing. But he was dancing it very wildly, making quite a demonstration. Again, as a king, how do kings normally conduct themselves? 
Regularly. Regularly. That is correct. National leaders are supposed to conduct themselves in a manner that is very uh, formal, very, I don't know, and not necessarily regal if you got a president and, and I, well, <laughs> but dignified. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. Very dignified. And nothing about this dance and the way we read it was dignified or regal. Once again, he is teaching his people, his subjects, a lesson, isn't he? Be humble before the Lord and worship the Lord with all your might. How does that, in our even in our New Testament Christianity, what does that remind you of with all of his might? His emotions were laid bare. His emotions were laid bare. It was just out there. He was not holding back. None whatsoever. What does it, does that just the term all your might does that remind you of anything else that we love the Lord your God with all your thank you it's the greatest commandment it, it is a part of the greatest commandment love the Lord your God with all of your heart your strength your mind so well all your strength all your might and that's what David's doing that's part of the greatest commandment that David is doing as he's dancing I think sometimes we skip over that part now. I'm going to ask this question. How many of you would this have made uncomfortable? I'm going to raise my hand. I am. I'm going to raise my hand. And one of the questions here is, you know, when we before we start wearing Michael out over her reaction, which it was wrong. I mean, God didn't approve of Michael's reaction. But we have to do that, going back to that discernment and that self-introspection. How would I have felt had I seen that? How do I feel today? When I see others, and, and we'll get to that question here in a few minutes. Let's, let's keep free because I'm going to get this way off this. Verse. Can I throw out something? You can. And just before this, David did what was wrong, and he realized that first he was mad at God for killing Uzzah, or Uzzah, what uh, mm -hmm. he was saying. But, and yet he... Um, he realized what he had done wrong. And so he immediately wanted to do what was right. The same thing when his son died. You know, he was down on the floor crying and praying and all. And yet his, as soon as his son had died and he had the answer, then he got up and praised God. I think that's part of, I had never thought of it. I think that's part of his demeanor is that when he sins, he knows it. And he changes, and he goes all out to praise God. And that's why he was dancing the way he was, uh, you know. I think that's, a, I mean, that's a great point. Because if you look at all the things in David's life, and, and you know, we've talked about this before, because we've talked about David on, in, this, in these lessons. David does lots of things wrong in his life. Right. But what you just said, it seems like David recovers mm -hmm. from those wrongs well he recovers well i guess is the term he doesn't go unpunished because we've talked about the things that have happened in david that happened in david's life where god said you can't do this you know you can't build the temple your family is going to suffer you're they're going to be a family who's going to suffer through a lot of bad things they're going to you know the sword is going to be prominent in your family people are going to die from the sword because you are a man of the sword and so he's he's made these things but what you're saying is right david bounces back and i think that that's how david earned the praise that he got in the New Testament, where he was called a man after God's own heart. And how many of us would have loved to be that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and you were going to tell what God wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And I was reading ahead and I want to bring out one point. So at the very end, in verse 23, it said, And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. You know, I wonder if all this happened so that Saul's daughter would not have the heir. It's a good question because we know that we know that God told Saul that it would not be his lineage. Yeah. Yeah. And I hadn't even thought of that part of it. But we know that that is. Let's go look at what she said to get her in that trouble. 
Verse 16 says, Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him for that. Move down to verse 20. And it says, Then David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So we see, and, and I think it's interesting that in both of these verses, she's called Michael, the daughter of Saul. So that is pointed out over and over. Michael, the daughter of Saul. But she goes sarcastic, doesn't she? This sounds like the way that, I mean, we treat people sometimes in verse 20, where she says, how awesome did you look today? Didn't you look like a king? Basically, she's saying, you did what? Embarrassed. You embarrassed me. I'm embarrassed. I can't believe you would do that. So she comes out and she just gives it to him. And the thing is, as she does this, but okay, let's back up for a second. What do we know about Michael? Let, let's give Michael a little credit because it may not just all stem from this dancing scene. If you remember, let's talk about Michael real quick. I've got several things. Number one, she loved David. We read that. She loved David after he killed Goliath. It's the first time we're told that, that she was in love with David. So she did love him. David loved her. What did David do to win her? Y'all remember that story? He went and killed 200 Philistines. 200 Philistines. And brought the proof back to King Saul so that he could marry Michael. So there was a love there at one time from both sides. Then it says that she helped David escape Saul. And what was basically her punishment for helping David escape Saul? She was given to another man. She was given to, uh, I believe his name is, I don't know how to say it, P-A-L-T-I, Paul P-L-T. So she was given to him. So then she's in this marriage for X number of years. I, I didn't research that, and I apologize that for, because it could be important. But we know that when David sent to bring Michael back to him, that her husband, the second husband, followed them down the road wailing and lamenting because he so loved Michael that we have to wonder, did Michael also love him at that point? You know, that that might play into this a little bit. So now Michael has gotten into subtle life and David pulled her back away from this man who obviously just adored her. So there's that. Um, and then also when she, when she returns to David at this point, he's older, he's the king, he has taken the place of who? Her father. What has happened to her family? David is gone. Saul is, I'm sorry, not David. Jonathan's gone. Saul is gone. Ishbeth is, is, thank you. Ishbeth, yes, he's been gone. He's been taken from her as well. So she has seen just horrible things happen to her family. And she knows that the root of it is Saul being not a good king, but she also knows that the one that got to take the place, and stop and think about this, he actually took the place of her father, who was a girl's first love. Yeah. And so he came in and took his place and basically her family's place. So she's got all these things going on and she comes back and there's also now other Wow. wives. <laughs> I don't for the life of me know how that could ever work and, and yet they did. But he's got, a, so now she's not the only love of his life. She isn't. So the whole situation is different, isn't it? So there may be some bitterness in her heart. It does not excuse the fact that God did what? He judged her, didn't he? She did this. She made these decisions. She ridiculed the chosen one of God for the way he was worshiping. And God punishes her for that. And I don't think that it's an accident that it says my, that uh, Michael, the daughter of Saul, again, had no children to the day of her death. Because the word that my verse starts off with is therefore. Mm -hmm. And therefore means what? And so it follows. And so it follows. There's a cause and relationship. I mean, a cause and uh, effect relationship in that word. Therefore, she did not have children. And I've never even thought about the fact that that would keep Saul's lineage from being able to, to happen. So um, 
we've already kind of looked at, we've, we've gotten ahead and looked at uh, the fact that God punished her. What was David's response? I, I'm kind of proud of David's response. That I will uh, celebrate the Lord. That's right. If we read verses 21 and 22, he says, So David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord. I will even be more undignified than this, and I will humble, I will, excuse me, and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken by them, I will be held in honor. So he tells her, he answers her questions. Hey, I am here because God put me here. And yes, he put me here over your family. He put me here. And because of that, I am going to, I am going to worship with all my might. I am going to be even more undignified. And those people that you're saying are going to hold me in contempt, they're going to love me. So you're wrong. So anyway, David does a good job of answering this. It kind of reminds me of the, the place where uh, I believe it's Paul, and I can't remember who his companion was. Man, I, I know it's Peter. And they told the Jewish leaders, hey, if you're going to make me choose between doing what you tell me to do and what God tells me to do, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. That's David's answer right here. I ain't going to worship him, and you can't stop me. So I know it's about time to be done, so let me ask you these questions. <coughs> The first one that I take out of the story is, do we worship like David? How many of us can really say we worship with all our might? How many of you find yourself, and, and I'm just going to ask a series of questions, and they're just for you to think about. They're not, we don't have to answer these out loud. Um, how do you look at others in a worship service when you see them doing something that maybe you're uncomfortable with, but you know they're doing it because their heart has been touched? You know, how do we look at other people? And what does it say about us? Um, how do we keep ourselves from finding ourselves in Michael's position? How do we keep from finding ourselves in Michael's position where we may be um, not necessarily attacking, but ridiculing someone else for what they did out of their love for the Lord? So there's a lot of these questions that we've got to make sure that we ask ourselves. Um, there's so much more. If you go look in Romans 14, it talks about judgment and judging your brothers. Um, we were going to talk about that. If you go look in Matthew 26, uh, verses 8 and 9, it gives you some sense of what God values versus what we value in worships, uh, worshiping him. And there's just this, this whole subject is something we could have, I think, a whole series of lessons about, not just a one-day lesson. Yes, sir. I think one thing that's <clears throat> important about this passage is because we look at it and it frankly it's a little bit weird to us because I don't think we have any concept of how important it was to bring this was God coming back to dwell among his people basically to bring the throne of God back to his people now, I don't think we have any concept we just think they're bringing a box in and David's I'm kind of going a little nuts um, I don't think we have any concept how big this was. Well, we even know that in the verses we read, it said, well, I don't think we read it. I skipped them, but we kind of summarized them. It even talks about the fact that when he failed the first time, he took the, the ark to a man's house. Mm -hmm. And and it mentions that that man and his entire household were blessed while the ark was in his presence. Mm -hmm. And it's because of what you're saying. This was the seat of, the seat of God. This is where Moses would go to speak. To God. And so you're right about the importance of that. And, you know, and, and I would venture to say in all my questions that I asked there at the end is, is maybe how serious do we consider the worship that we have when we approach God, now that we have the opportunity to approach God in the way that we can? And what is our mindset when we approach God? Not only do we worship Him with all our might, but do we have the correct reverence? Do we humble ourselves like David humbled himself as well? That's all I've got for today. I've got you out a couple minutes late. I apologize for that. If I'm getting into the sermon, into the service where he's already, they already start singing. So thank you for your attention and for your participation. Appreciate it.